Welcome to Comic Tropes, I'm your host Chris. Today I want to talk about one of the best artists in comics. He's a true modern master. It's actually a little difficult to talk about his work because when you look at his whole life, his whole career, he's never had any personal drama to speak of. He's never changed his art style in any big, obvious, noticeable ways. And he's never explored any creator-owned work to sort of explore more of a personal side. Instead, he has worked consistently, mostly at DC Comics, for about half a century, quietly producing gorgeous, realistic, convincing, panel-to-panel -panel pages. Uh, I want to talk about the artwork of Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. We're going to take a look at some of his longer runs, some of his influences, and some of his working styles. Before I get too far, please consider hitting like and subscribe. That really helps the channel. And without any further ado, let's get into it. Jose Luis Garcia Lopez's life began in Spain back in 1948, but he and his family moved to Argentina when he was five years old. He grew up reading imported comics like Donald Duck and Tom and Jerry and read all the newspaper strips, becoming fascinated with sequential art at an early age. Seeing Garcia Lopez's interest, his sister bought him a correspondence course at the Continental School when he was only 10 years old. The teachers mostly taught how to do humor comics, and the instructors quickly recognized that Jose Luis was more interested in realistic work, so they put him in touch with various local publishers. By 13 years old, he was already getting work at a small publisher in Argentina, and by 16, he decided to formally attend art school at the Escuela Panamerica de Arte. While there, one of his instructors was Alberto Breccia, who was known for a wide variety of Argentinian comics, including Mort Cinder, a very popular horror title. Breccia was one of Garcia Lopez's local influences, as well as writer and publisher Hector Esterheld, who famously wrote The Eternaut, among other comic strips and books. Other influences at the time included Cray Collins, a Spanish artist known for good pacing, and Alex Raymond, whose Flash Gordon strip infused fine art principles into the artwork. There was also Harold Foster, who Garcia Lopez noted included elaborate character design and heavily detailed backgrounds. Milton Caniff, who did the Terry and the Pirates strip, influenced him to keep things expressive and energetic. Later, when Garcia Lopez became a working professional, he noted contemporaries like Neil Adams for showing him how to use dynamic layouts and well-muscled superheroes, and Ross Andrew, who Garcia Lopez felt put the artwork before the artist, as in, he focused on clear storytelling over style. Garcia Lopez displayed his talent from a young age and was working regularly for larger publishers by age 16. He got some work from Squew, which was a Catholic publisher who liked to produce wholesome sci-fi stories. He obtained work at U.S. publisher Charlton by the time he was 18 through an agent. That was his first U.S. work and was all on romance comics, very popular at the time. He began working on his first monthly ongoing work at a large Argentinian publisher, Columba, most notably on a pirate comic written by Hector Esterheld called Roland El Corsario. The pages for Roland are gorgeous. They're very regimented in terms of consistent panel layout and plenty of text, but they're so clean and exciting. The posing and gesture work is superior, and it all looks convincingly real. Masterful! It's clear that from the very beginning, Garcia Lopez was very versatile, that he could work on pretty much any type of story, but he really excelled at historical dramas. He's spoken in interviews about how he regularly went to the library to gather reference and research his topics, and I think it really pays off. Uh, when you look at his work on Roland El Carsario, that pirate comic was one of his longer runs. He did that from 72 to 74. And unfortunately, I have not found any evidence that it was ever translated into English and published here in North America. Uh, but if you Google it, you can still find plenty of fan pages that have scans and the artwork is gorgeous. Definitely worth taking a look at. 
By 1974, Garcia Lopez decided to move from Buenos Aires to another large international city, New York. He had no contacts, not even with Charlton, who he'd worked with before. Instead, he hoped the strength of his work would get him a syndicated newspaper strip. He was put in touch with artist Luis Dominguez, who took him around one day to DC, Marvel, and Western. But DC was the company that made the biggest impression, with the editors and publisher making time to meet Garcia Lopez and review his work. Garcia Lopez has commented on how friendly and welcoming DC made him feel, saying, quote, It was terrific, because it was not the way I was used to working in Argentina, where you met the president of the company after many, many months of working for them. I really felt very welcome at DC. I felt very, very happy with the reception I received. And this was the reception that Garcia Lopez received without even any sort of formal appointment. Dominguez was just dropping off some artwork to editor Joe Orlando and introduced Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. And that was an appointment that obviously made a huge impression. Orlando is definitely one of the editors that started giving him work right away. Garcia Lopez's earliest work at DC was inking established pencilers like Ernie Chan on Flash and most prominently, Kurt Swan on a five-page Superman story called The Private Life of Clark Kent. Joe Orlando quickly recognized Garcia Lopez's talent and placed him as the artist on Jonah Hex. A Western was a perfect fit for Garcia Lopez, who still made time to do random issues like Adventure Comics No. 442 and three issues of Joker. He also worked on a few stories for Western, like Twilight Zone and Grimm's Ghost Stories, but soon had all of his time monopolized by DC. Jonah Hex shows us that Garcia Lopez can do more than just drama and historical pieces. Hex mixed in horror and big action regularly. Sadly, the title dipped to 80,000 copies and ended up on the chopping block. It is amazing to think that 80,000 copies was once considered too low selling to bother continuing with because it really speaks to the difference in time and how today all sorts of different media channels have fractured the audience and at this point 80,000 copies on a comic book would be considered pretty strong. Uh, you can absolutely make a profit on 80,000 copies. Different times. During this time, Garcia Lopez seemed to lightly explore other options, doing a single story for Whitman, a sci-fi story called Starstream. But DC seemed to understand the value of keeping Garcia Lopez with them, and quickly placed him onto Hercules Unbound. That was even more catered to Garcia Lopez, as it was a historical adventure series, and he had complete input on designing the characters. Garcia Lopez has commented on how historical stories are some of his favorite. Much of this run was inked by Wally Wood, who was a titan in the industry through the 50s and 60s. But towards the end of his years, his inks were really only adequate. And that's Garcia Lopez admitting that. He also did a few issues of a Tarzan series. In an interview with Two Moros, Garcia Lopez says he grew up reading that comic strip, but he did not like artist Bern Hogarth's work, calling it too academic. Instead, he preferred the work of Bob Lubbers, who Garcia Lopez believes understood how to add energy because he was drawing a comic, not just a piece of artwork. It helps give us some insight into what Garcia Lopez feels is important, because while Garcia Lopez clearly has good anatomy and perspective, he understands the need to include dynamic shots and poses to engage a reader with a story. Jonah Hex and Hercules Unbound stand out when you're looking at Garcia Lopez's bibliography because they're both somewhat extended runs on a monthly title. And Garcia Lopez has talked about how he has trouble keeping up with that schedule. He certainly isn't slow, but 22 pages a month is slightly pushing what he feels he's capable of. Now, to editor Joe Orlando's credit, he recognized not only Garcia Lopez's talent, but also his work pace. And he found a lot of fill-in issues and special projects to occupy Garcia Lopez's time throughout the rest of the 70s. Some of these issues are pretty special, like Superman vs. Wonder Woman, masterful, 
and issues of DC Special Series and DC Comics Presents. This saw Garcia Lopez working on prominent stories for DC's biggest characters, and saw his interpretations of their superheroes slowly becoming the face of DC, at least informally. It's worth noting that in 1978, DC Comics was facing incredible competition from Marvel and cut its number of titles in half. This event is unofficially known as the DC Implosion, but Garcia Lopez was kept as busy as ever. By 1979, Garcia Lopez decided to move down to Miami, where he kept busy on these fill-ins and one-shots. But by 1980, he decided to move back to New York, and it was at that time that DC reached out to him to work on one of the most important projects of his entire career with them, and one that fans never got to see until very, very recently. This project was a massive tome known as the DC Style Guide, which came out in 1980. It was page after page of the definitive looks for each character DC had, which was shared with any licensees, so that they knew how a character should be presented on merchandise. This guide itself wasn't available for sale, but there's an excellent chance you grew up familiar with Garcia Lopez's artwork by seeing it on t-shirts, or drinking glasses. There are now fan pages where you can pour over these pages and they are gorgeous. Batman is moody. Wonder Woman is powerful and glamorous. Superman is powerful and happy. The images are great and Garcia Lopez was asked to update it a bit each year for quite a while. Just look at how subtle but effective the poses are for Superman versus Captain Marvel, to see how it defines the character properly. Masterful! It is a treat to look at these pages, and even though it's now 30 years old, it would still be a treat to see a published version one day. DC could have easily gone with a top-selling superstar like Neil Adams, or an established pro like Kurt Swan, who really defined the look of Superman at the time, but instead they opted to hire Garcia Lopez, which I think really speaks to just how important he was perceived to be to DC Comics itself. While Garcia Lopez could easily handle superheroes, his editors knew that he'd get more engaged working on stories in other genres. A deal between DC and Atari led to plans to adapt their game Star Raiders into a comic. Garcia Lopez was asked not just to draw the comic, but color it as well. Despite his objections, his editors were confident he could handle it, and it's a rare case of getting to see him color his work. I find it dynamic, but Garcia Lopez has said that he agrees with the opinion of artist Bill Sienkiewicz that it has too many colors. The book was changed from an ongoing to a standalone story and became DC's first graphic novel. Following that was the last of Garcia Lopez's extended monthly comics work as he worked on 12 consecutive issues of Atari Force, another adaptation of Atari material. In two of the issues, he inked Ross Andrew, but he illustrated the other 10 and had a lot of input with writer Jerry Conway on character design and story pacing. You wouldn't necessarily expect Atari Force to be something special. It's based on a licensed idea of a gaming console long in the past, but it's fantastic. I think that Garcia Lopez and Conway were given a lot of leeway in telling the kinds of stories that they wanted to, and ultimately there's a lot of passion behind this project. There's also some really well-defined characters. It's obvious that the two creators really, really cared about what they were making. I definitely recommend looking for it. It's never been reprinted, but it doesn't go for that that much. It's a back issue worth hunting for. In 1981, Garcia Lopez was drafted to illustrate Batman vs. Hulk, an oversized crossover from Marvel and DC. It's one of the two times Garcia Lopez has illustrated a Marvel character, although the work was officially done through DC. It's a fun issue, inked mostly by Dick Giordano, although you can look closely and see that some of the pages aren't quite up to his standards. It's likely that these pages were inked by the Krusty Bunkers, the name given to anyone in Giordano's company Continuity Studios who was available to fill in on last-minute projects. 
Garcia Lopez illustrated fill-in issues of Teen Titans with Marv Wolfman and several issues of Dead Man. He made the interesting choice of utilizing duotone to give Dead Man shading that isn't seen in his other work. It helps ground it, and it's a pretty successful experiment with his work. Other interesting work includes a fill-in issue on indie comic Nexus, because artist Steve Rude asked him to do it, and a Wonder Man pinup for Marvel, because inker Joe Rubenstein wanted to work with him. That single page remains his only work done through Marvel. Looking at his career, Garcia Lopez spent decades working at DC, but he never had an exclusive contract with him. I will say, I think this is a miss on Garcia Lopez's part, because he was kept busy enough that he may as well have had the exclusive and gotten paid some sort of a bonus for his work. He's talked about how comfortable and happy he was working for DC Comics, which I think is fantastic, but I do think that he ultimately should have looked out for himself a little bit more. Without many extended runs, it's easy for a video like this to simply be a recap of his work. Looking at projects like Twilight with Howard Chaikin that seems to add a European flavor, with some of the stylistic touches that remind me of Mobius. Or his many Elseworlds stories and Doctor Strange Fate from the DC Marvel crossover story Amalgam in the 90s. But I find it more interesting to dig into one last piece that he did with Jerry Conway, his writer from Atari Force. Together, they did a limited series called Cinder and Ash. It's a crime story, with the two main settings being New Orleans and Vietnam. It's amazing how convincing and detailed the world is. Garcia Lopez excels at facial expressions and pacing, so the mature theme drama is another standout if you want to dig into his artwork. Masterful! The closest thing to this is his early comic strip fill-ins from Argentina or his issues of On the Road to Perdition later on. Garcia Lopez has said in interviews he doesn't think he is as dynamic as artists like Neil Adams. And while he may not go to the same extremes with his perspective, with super low angles or big for shortening, he absolutely works in some exquisite perspective work and clear and easy to read gesture and expression. His pages are easy to read if you remove the dialogue. In this book, Modern Masters Volume 5 by Two Moros, you get to see a lot of the process work that Jose Luis Garcia Lopez does. We're talking everything from like sketches to inks to color work. Uh, it's, it's amazing. And on top of that, there's a lot of amazing stories in here. He talks about his process of how he likes to work primarily in the morning on harder stuff, which he considers layouts and inking. He may spend a couple hours in the afternoon, but he doesn't usually work in the evenings unless he's up against a deadline. On top of that, he talks about his very specific processes. We're talking about his decisions like using a softer lead in humid weather or a harder lead when it's dry. Really interesting stuff. You'll also get to learn how his work from Argentina and the U.S. differs, which is mostly that the U.S. uses an assembly line system, like assigning inkers to work on Garcia Lopez's pencils, whereas in Argentina, the system is mostly just writer and artist, but the artist may use assistance for some parts. Talking about Jose Luis Garcia Lopez's artwork has been unlike any other video I've made because there isn't necessarily an arc to his career. Uh, yes, he's experimented with color and with duotone, but his artwork from the time he was a teenager up until modern day is consistently beautiful and fantastic. He was great right from the beginning. Uh, you know, you look at like some of his modern work, he's done short stories on things like Action Comics number one, uh, 1000, Detective Comics 1000, he's done the occasional cover. He's still producing gorgeous work in his 70s. It's amazing. Uh, if anything, I do think that it's ultimately a little bit of a loss that he never tried to do a creator-owned project and, you know, did something that he was really passionate about, like Atari Force, but where he could cut loose even more. I, I wish we'd gotten to see that in his career. I mean, I suppose it's never too late, but it does seem unlikely at this point in time. I would have liked to have seen that. But if you read interviews, 
Jose Garcia Lopez seems like a very happy and content person that doesn't want to live his life with regrets. So beyond just looking at the gorgeous artwork that he's able to produce, maybe we can learn something from his personality. Anyway, I've got a few recommendations for where to start if you haven't read a lot of his work, but first let's take a quick look at the fan art that came in, then I'll jump back with those recommendations. Marvin Duran illustrated me as a swamp creature known as the Tropes Thing. You can see more of his work on Instagram. Mark Taktak sent in some artwork where I'm the Dark Knight, Cyclops, Mr. Sinister, and a customized action figure. Pretty cool. Tomas Dagum created a great cartoon where I'm being chased by Man-Thing for making too many puns. Shane Klink drew me getting rescued by Man-Thing like the damsel in distress that I am. You can see more of his work at his site. Sal Otero envisions me comforting Man-Thing after his terrible R.L. Stein comics. You can see more by Sal on his YouTube channel. Teague Ricks shows us that whatever knows humor burns at the touch of Man-Thing, so I am toast. Roger Okawole illustrated a full 2000 AD cover with me as Judge Dredd. You can see more of his work on Instagram. Pedro Nuno Lopez sent in this amazing piece, which envisions me as a Lego minifig. You can see more of Pedro's work on Instagram. Brian Figgins built myself, Infotron, and the Gachapon machine out of Lego. I think we look cool. Finally, Gerard D'Souza created this artwork where I am Man-Thing and I'm burning some poor soul. You can see more by Gerard on Instagram. Folks, it's always a treat to see fan art. As long as it has something to do with comic tropes, I'm always happy to share it. You can just send that in to comictropes at gmail.com. I'll feature it. And then on top of that, I will pick a winner to get a gachapon prize that I picked up in Japan. So we had uh, 10 entrants. And let's see who won this time. Spinning the ball hopper. All right, number, number seven. Number seven was this artwork, so congratulations. I will send out the prize. Let's figure out what you got. I'll pull that out of the Gachapon machine that was donated by Lunar Shine Store. Very appreciative of that. And then I can talk to you about some recommendations because Jose Luis Garcia Lopez's artwork has been sort of all over the place. He's done lots and lots of fill-in issues. All right, here we go. Uh, looks like it's something to do with Pacific Rim. It just has Pacific Rim here, so it must be some sort of Pacific Rim robot. Congratulations, number seven. I'll send that your way. A few places that I would recommend starting with Garcia Lopez's artwork. I'd look for his Jonah Hex issues. I think that that's some of his earliest American work that can be interesting to compare to later stuff, and Jonah Hex is a pretty cool character. I think that's really strong right from the beginning. I think that, personally, one of my favorite things that he's done has been Atari Force. So, if you can find Atari Force, 12 issues, pretty cool story. I think he was really passionate. I think he really gave that a lot of effort. So that's the second thing I'd recommend. And then the third recommendation I have would be to look for Cinder and Ash. Um, it's a lot more mature than the other stuff. Uh, and it's also just gorgeous. You know, the, the environments are amazing. The character design is solid. Um, it is a mature title but I definitely give that a strong recommendation as well. So those are three places I would focus on looking for his work, which kind of jump through his career at different uh, points in time. Runner-up recommendations for Jose Luis Garcia Lopez would include Twilight for what I consider his best overall artwork, and the Venom storyline in Legends of the Dark Knight for what I consider to be his best overall inking work. Uh, and then of course, something that isn't printed, but that you can look up online, look up those pages for the DC style guide. They're really amazing. You're just like, yeah, this is what that character should look like, at least in my opinion. DC really had something special with Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. I'm sure that if Marvel could have, they would have loved to have gotten a hold of him for a book. Uh, and we can only imagine what that would have been like. I would have loved to have seen him do something at you know, Image or, you know, Dark Horse in the 90s. Uh, one of these places that does something creator-owned. 
It's not too late. He's semi-retired. He hasn't done a lot in the last two years. I, I, you know, I think that the last thing he may have done was the uh, the cover for Detective Comics 1000. Not the cover. Um, there's a story inside, or a page at least. I can't I can't remember now. Sorry. Um, that was, I think, the last thing he did. He may have done a cover for DC since then. Still as talented as ever. You know, sometimes people get older and their work becomes a lot looser, but I think that Jose Luis Garcia Lopez's work is as tight and fluid as ever. That's something I think you look at. There's a fluidity to his form. I'm trying to think of anybody else that sort of reminds me of him. Maybe a little bit Alan Davis, the British artist. I don't know if Garcia Lopez was a direct influence, but you know, there's a fluidity to that. Um, anyway, he's just always been one of my favorite artists. Always an exciting treat if you were reading an issue as a kid and you saw his name. It was like, oh cool, this is going to be extra good. So, I thought it was worth putting out there. He deserves a lot of credit. I'm sure he's influenced a ton of people that are working today. And honestly, maybe subconsciously. We probably grew up with him on our underoos or on the artwork for action figures, you know? And didn't realize. But it was his artwork. So, uh, I've got an interview coming up soon. I've got some episodes about some foreign comics coming up soon. A few indie comics. I'm pretty excited. Um, so, please stay tuned. I really appreciate you guys watching. I appreciate the subscribers. That count just keeps going up. Um, I'm very, very grateful. I really, really am. The channel's been doing great. It's all thanks to you. So I'll see you real soon. Until then, keep reading comics.